following program is sponsored by CBN. Today, a child with a rare disease. He just kept saying, why is the room moving? If he's treated, he may never walk again. He may be in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. See how he became a college football standout. And they're like, what? No way. And they were cheering. Our week of prayer continues. It was for the grace of God, and he did a miracle on me. On today's 700 Club. Welcome to the 700 Club, and thanks for joining us. Another high-ranking official in Washington has tested positive for COVID. Kamala Harris, the vice president, doesn't have any symptoms, and she's working from home. The good news, although case numbers are up, they're still relatively low and with milder symptoms. Hospitalizations are at the lowest point since the pandemic began. Medical reporter Lori Johnson has the details. Many public health experts recommend changing the way we measure the severity of COVID-19 surges. They say these days it makes a lot more sense to focus on how many people are being hospitalized for COVID instead of paying so much attention to how many people merely have it. This discussion began in earnest following alarming media reports after a number of government officials tested positive, including 82-year-old Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Pelosi, who was pictured kissing 77-year-old President Biden. Then information indicated the media blast was a bit overblown as those infected had only mild or asymptomatic cases. Medical experts also pointed out that after two years of COVID, most Americans now enjoy some level of immunity from vaccination, past infection, or both. Nancy Pelosi, for example, they're tested maybe even on a daily basis, and those tests are reported out. EVMS public health expert Dr. Brian Martin says while reported cases are sharply increasing, the true number is likely much higher. The big takeaway? Today's infections are generally mild. Many may even mistake COVID for springtime allergies. There's a lot of home test kits, so none of that gets reported. If you do a home test, you don't call your local health department and say, hey, I tested positive for COVID so that they now have that case. Um, there are also asymptomatic uh, people in the community that are positive for COVID and don't know it. While paying attention to rising case numbers made sense in the early days of the pandemic, focusing on infections alone can now be misleading, making the threat appear worse than it really is. For example, after cases shot up 50 percent in just two weeks, colleges from coast to coast brought back mask mandates, including American American University in Washington, D.C. I would say kind of a comforting feeling that they were back, but almost like a too little too late since our cases had already spiked. Hospitalizations, however, rose only 4% nationwide in the same time frame. Even the new White House COVID response coordinator says while the overall number of infections remains relevant, it's really the number of serious ones that more accurately reflects the true risk we face. We should look at cases. Uh, it should be one of the factors. Uh, but we should also be looking at hospitalizations, obviously, because that matters more. And then we should be looking at hospital capacity. Thankfully, hospitalizations are at the lowest level we've seen since the pandemic began. Medical experts have reason to believe the number will remain low because in addition to a higher level of immunity, new treatments are becoming more widely available and vaccines are being developed to specifically target Get new variants. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Well, the great news is that hospitalizations are down, and what a, what a wonderful story that is. We need to congratulate everyone in the healthcare industry, uh, all of the nurses, all of the doctors, anyone involved from the person at the front desk all the way to the person handling how do you uh, launder all of these. Uh, bed sheets. It's just amazing the sacrifices they all went through to give us health care. And it's a wonderful thing to hear that they're getting some relief. In other news, Russia is playing hardball with two European countries in the war with Ukraine. Efren Graham has that story from the CBN newsroom. Efren. 
Gordon, Russia shut off natural gas to Poland and Bulgaria. Both are strong supporters of Ukraine. Poland's climate minister says the country has plenty of natural gas in reserve. Russia's move comes one day after the United States and other Western allies promised to quickly send more and better military supplies to Ukraine. Russian forces are keeping up their attacks amid fears the war could spill over Ukraine's borders. President Biden said to wait a month to see if sanctions were working. The war has already lasted much longer, and some experts say Russia's continued assaults are proof sanctions have not slowed Putin's war machine. Caitlin Burke has that story. The Biden administration's approach to sanctions remains a gradual one. And while it successfully brought together a number of other countries to put economic pressure on Russia, analysts warn it's not deterring Putin's pursuit of Ukraine. When the Biden administration announced sanctions on the 24th of February, they specifically said, in fact, the president himself tweeted that their goal was to reduce the ruble to rubble. Unfortunately, as we've seen today, with the ruble trading uh, at higher levels against the dollar than before the attack, by their own metric, the Biden administration has failed. Marshall Billingsley, former assistant secretary for terrorist financing at the Treasury Department, says instead of dealing a crushing blow to Russia's economy, the Biden administration has deferred to European countries that rely on Russian oil and gas. They'd rather see the price of their heating bills in their homes uh, be lower than to take the shorter term economic pain to cause Putin's war machine to melt down financially. Billingsley believes what's needed is the playbook used against Iran and Venezuela during the Trump administration. Full sanctions on the energy sector, accompanied by secondary sanctions against any country continuing to do business with Russia. Also, similar action against other valuable exports like metals and minerals. Plus, full sanctions against the entire Russian financial sector. Why are we pulling our punches? Where, what is the moral compass at work here, uh, given what we're seeing? I don't, I don't see it, and I find the uh, refusal to fully sanction the Russian economy uh, into the ground the way they are physically doing to the Ukrainian people, uh, I find it morally unconscionable that we're not doing more and faster and better. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is pushing the Biden administration to trigger some of the toughest sanctions under U.S. law by designating Russia a state sponsor of terror. Uh, there are only a handful of countries that have been designated as state sponsors of terrorism, uh, and uh, Russia belongs in that camp. But would that designation and its consequences have any impact? I don't believe Putin is in the habit of receiving messages at this stage. Uh, the key is perhaps not messaging to him, it's messaging to those around him that unless and until the war stops in Ukraine, uh, and perhaps unless and until Vladimir Putin is gone, uh, the sanctions pressure will continue to grow and Russia will be reduced back to its Soviet era breadlines. As fighting in Ukraine again escalates, the Biden administration says it's committed to raising pressure on Russia. Many observers are asking, however, will it be enough? Caitlin Burke, CBN News. As Ukrainians flee the warfare at home, CBN's Orphans Promise is providing them with food from a unique farming project. Take a look. Our farm to school project here in Hust, Ukraine, is teaching the Roma children not just to uh, all the life skills that they will need to succeed in their lives, but also how to feed themselves. So through our seed program, Something to Eat Every Day, we are about to plant this plot of land where they are going to be getting the food to their own tables, but also they are collecting eggs here with the quail and chickens. And they not only help with getting the food towards their own tables, but they also are helping the refugees right now that are coming from the East. And so the eggs collected today and really every day, part of them go to help the refugee families coming, fleeing from the war. Yeah. <laughs> 
a unique way to lend a hand. Gordon? Very unique way, and that's part of the signature of Orphan's Promise. How do we help people? Help people in very tangible ways. If I can get the map of Orphan Promise Centers, you can see how that's being rep replicated across Ukraine. Orphan's Promise working in Ukraine now for over 20 years, and this war isn't stopping our work. We want to continue to help people, help people have the ability to feed themselves as well as to provide for the refugees the food and water, the shelter, the direction that they need. If you want to be a part of it, all you have to do is give to the Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund. It's real easy. Pick up the phone and call 1-800-700-7000. Or you can write to us at CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. Just put Disaster Relief Fund in the memo line of a check. You can text us, OB Crisis, to 71777 or go to CBN.com. Either way, do it now. Ashley? Well, still ahead, he's a long snapper for the Oklahoma State Cowboys, and that's a miracle. See how the power of prayer helped this young man overcome a crippling disease that affects one in 10 million children. Also ahead, thousands of Jewish refugees are fleeing Ukraine. Some of them are Holocaust survivors. See how a rescue operation is bringing them home to Israel after this. Holocaust Remembrance Day begins at sundown today. Survivors of the Holocaust are among the thousands of Jews who have fled the war in Ukraine. These Jewish refugees are hoping to make a new home in Israel. Chris Mitchell brings us their story. Ukrainians forced to flee their homes because of war. Some of them Holocaust survivors and others fleeing for a second time. You can imagine the atmosphere, nervous tension, and an unpredictable destiny. What can one expect other than being murdered? Almost all the buildings around us burn down. When a mortar hits a building, it starts a fire, and there are no means to extinguish it. There is no water in the city. While a nightmare for many fleeing Ukrainians, these Jewish refugees have a unique hope for the future. You heard in the borders, when the Jewish community waiting for people there, and there's buses, and they know we're going to leave, and they know that Israel is helping them to come, it's like, if already to be a refugee, it's better to be a Jewish refugee. The Israeli government and Jewish organizations are banding together to make it possible. Alona Grosu of the Jewish community of Moldova says when they heard about the war, they knew the world would never be the same. So from this day, we've um, started organizing a rescue operation for the members of the Jewish communities from Ukraine. Overnight, the municipality in Kishinev, Moldova, opened its tennis center as a place for fleeing refugees, and the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews stepped in to help. With the Jewish community, with the joint, with all the organization, we built an opportunity to have places for the people to sleep, to eat, to be in a safe, warm place. More than 10,000 eligible Ukrainians have immigrated to Israel since the war began. They are fleeing Ukraine through Poland, Hungary, Romania, and about a third escaped through Moldova. From the border, these refugees are taken either to the Israeli consulate or the hub tennis center, where the Jewish agency determines their eligibility to immigrate to Israel. The foreign ministry provides them with papers and the IFCJ books them on charter flights. That's where CBN News met Ludmila Polonova, her mother Tatiana, and 16-year-old son Andre. It's a catastrophe. It was a miracle that we were able to leave Mariupol now. On March 12th, an aircraft bomb fell next to our house. All the windows, glass, window frames and doors were shattered. It was impossible to stay in the apartment. Ludmilla and her family lived in the basement for a week. We left thanks to my son. We found out that in the nine-story building next door, there was a phone reception on the ninth floor. My son remembered that his classmate lived in the neighboring town of Mangush and her father owned a minibus. My son ran to the ninth floor, called her, and her father took us out the very next day. It wasn't the first time this family had to escape. They fled the Donetsk region in 2014. This time, they have a different outlook. We expect some kind of well-being, a peaceful life. I want a future for my son. 
I hope everything will go well in Israel. It's hard to move, of course. All my friends are in Ukraine. But at least there will be peace in Israel. I think Israel is our salvation, and I think everything will go well for us. Until their departure, refugees are housed at places like this guest house outside Kishinev. Holocaust survivor Zenovi Lakarev came here after he turned 86 on March 16th. I didn't have a birthday. There was bombing and shelling. That's why I was at home. Two rocket explosions happened about 50 to 60 meters from our house. These were frightful explosions. Everything shook. The entire nine-story building was shaking. That's when I decided to leave. It brought back haunting memories. In September 1941, under bombing and shelling of the trains we were in, we left the city. We returned to Kharkiv in March of 1944. And 78 years later, with just a plastic bag in hand, Zenovi was on the run again. This time he has two daughters, two granddaughters, and a great-granddaughter waiting for him in Israel. I'm very happy that I'm finally going to leave this hell but it's very unpleasant and heavy for me. When the hotels and guest houses were full, the Jewish community and volunteers opened this warehouse where we met Vera Chimra. She also recalled her first time having to leave everything behind. My first evacuation took place 81 years ago in 1941. I remember a freight car. There was a transit camp like this, only this one is comfortable. Back then, the only thing we had was a blanket. Vera returned to Kharkiv after World War II and stayed put until now. I feel more cheerful. I'm able to move again. Before, I stopped moving. I had COVID with bad complications. My leg was paralyzed. I couldn't even imagine that I'd travel such distances as I didn't leave the house for half a year. So far, the IFCJ has helped more than 2,200 refugees fly to Israel from Moldova since the war started. But it's not a regular aliyah. Benny Haddad says they usually have a chance to prepare new immigrants before they come. You're touching the people for two seconds. They're coming here, they want as much as faster to be there because they live as refugees here without anything. And the main goal is to send them to Israel and save them from here. Zinovi and Lugmila, Tetiana and Andre were among 112 new immigrants and nine pets CBN News joined on the three-hour flight back to Israel. At the Kishinev airport, they were Ukrainian refugees, but within hours, they became citizens of Israel, fulfilling biblical prophecy. We don't comprehend it yet. Thank God there's no shooting. I hope I'll never hear it again. At my age, it's a new beginning. At this age, people hang up their fiddle completely, but I decided to change everything from the start. That was the first day of their new adventure as Israelis. It may not be easy here, but they'd be planted in the land of their forefathers and should never have to run away again. Chris Mitchell, CBN News. Well, congratulations to the fellowship for that wonderful work, also to the Jewish Agency and to the Joint, the JDC all of whom teaming together to provide uh, the refugees, the Jewish refugees, a new home in Israel. But let me underline, uh, this is just the beginning for them and the beginning of their need. Yes, they needed to be evacuated. They needed to be flown to Israel. But now in Israel, they've got to learn a new language. Many of them don't speak Hebrew. How do they find employment? How do they find housing? All of these things are needed. Uh, and this is just the beginning of a very long journey for them. So pray for the refugees. Uh, pray for these wonderful agencies that are helping, whether it's the fellowship or the Jewish agency or the JDC. Uh, this is going to be a long road for them. Uh, and it's, it, but it's wonderful to see. And it's wonderful to see prophecy fulfilled. Ashley. Well, up next, his parents were told he'd never ride a bike, throw a ball, or play sports. But just look at him now. Zeke Zaragoza is the long snapper for the Oklahoma State Cowboys. See the miracle that made it possible when we come back. I shouldn't be here. That thought goes through Zeke Zaragoza's mind when he steps onto the football field. For years, he battled a rare childhood disease that doctors predicted would leave him wheelchair bound. 
Instead, Zeke stunned everyone by becoming a long snapper for the Oklahoma State Cowboys. You know, there's thousands of people outside in the stadium waiting for you. So when you're walking out there, you're kind of getting amped up and the adrenaline's kicking in. Zeke Zaragoza, long snapper for the Oklahoma State Cowboys. Sometimes I have to step back and be like, wow, I'm here and this is real and I shouldn't be here. Playing Division I football is an achievement for any young man, especially for one doctors didn't expect would even be able to throw a ball. The youngest of three boys, Zeke was three when his parents, Ed and Shannon, noticed something wasn't right. He was walking down the hall and he started going sideways and he hit the wall. He just kept saying, why is the room moving? And um, if we were outside, why is the wind blowing me? Then he started throwing up and shaking. His pediatrician sent him to the hospital, where Zeke would spend the next two weeks undergoing a battery of tests, including MRIs, CT scans, and a spinal tap. Still, they had no answers. Then I started to get a little bit scared. If it was something simple, they'd have an answer right away. There's something wrong, and we're starting to see him get worse. Within a few weeks, Zeke couldn't even walk, and his eyes were darting back and forth. And he tells me, Dad, my, my eyes aren't working. And it's just, you know, that helpless feeling that, that you can't do anything for him. Despite their fears, Channon, who as a girl had seen her mother miraculously healed of cancer, trusted God, no matter the outcome. I think just being ingrained in my, my mind that God does miracles and he can heal you, it just made me believe, okay, well, that's what we're praying for. Neurologist Dr. Charles Neeson was brought in and consulted with over 20 specialists before diagnosing Zeke with a rare disorder that affects one in 10 million children. Opsoclonus myoclonus syndrome. So it's thought to be an autoimmune disease. Somehow the body is making antibodies against your eye muscles and nerve cells so that the, the nerves that control coordination in the, the back of the brain and the cerebellum aren't working so well. There was fear in knowing, okay, he's got something, but then there was also hope in knowing, okay, now what's the treatment? By now, Zeke had already been suffering from the condition for over two months, and something needed to be done quickly. It could have affected not only his coordination, but you know his thinking as well, his learning and his, his memory. His speech was already being affected. Dr. Neeson and a leading OMS specialist in Illinois offered them two treatment options. If we treat him aggressive, this is our hope. We hope he can walk again, we really believe he will, but he's not gonna be able to play a sport, throw a ball, ride a bike, do the normal kind of things that little boys do. And there could be side effects to it. Or we treat less aggressive, and he probably won't have a side effect, but he may be in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. After much prayer and consideration, Ed and Channon chose the aggressive option, hoping to give Zeke the best shot at long-term quality of life. Even then, there was a chance of relapse. For the first two years, Zeke endured a rigorous, painful treatment regimen that included twice daily injections in his legs and monthly antibody infusions that sometimes lasted 15 hours. I was the one that had to give him the shots every day. And, and you know, it was a struggle. I mean, he knew it was gonna hurt and, uh, you know, wishing you could take his place. Progress soon followed as within months, Zeke had graduated from a wheelchair to a walker. Then more setbacks. He developed obsessive compulsive disorder and Tourette's syndrome related to OMS. Shannon and Ed turned to God to keep hope alive. I was on the ground definitely because I was helpless, saying, okay, you know, you love him more than I do. And that's hard to even fathom as a mom, but God does. Then after treatment and physical therapy, Doctors declared seven-year-old Zeke to be in remission. By then, he was already testing and breaking the limits doctors thought he'd have. If he wanted to try it, we let him try it. We got some pictures of him riding around up front here on his bicycle in a Spider-Man outfit. And we're amazed he's riding a bicycle. And you can really stand on firm ground that, that this thing has really kind of literally left the premises. As for Zeke. I felt like a normal kid, like I do just about anything the other guys did. And as he grew older and stronger, that included several sports. Then in fifth grade, he was ready for something a little more physical. I really wanted to try football. And that's when my mom kind of was like, oh, I don't know. Channon called the OMS specialist, who put her on speakerphone for his colleagues to hear. 
And I said, Zeke wants to play football, is that okay? And they're like, what, no way, and they were cheering. And they just couldn't believe it because he was considered a severe case. And so he said, absolutely. Zeke went on to be a center and then long snapper in high school, where he decided he wanted to go to the next level. I just kept pushing and had that one vision that I wanted to play college football to share my story. The dedication and the drive that he has, he's just so determined and humble at the same time. After graduating in 2018, Zeke earned a spot as a long snapper for Oklahoma State, where he's studying to become a PE teacher and coach and sharing his story. But it was for the grace of God and he did a miracle on me. To see him go on and be a successful student and play football is just totally unpredicted and un unprecedented. It is a miracle that he is where he is. Never put limitations on God. He sees way in advance. We just follow along. We do what we're supposed to do. And he, he has the big picture at the end. And never doubt. Amen. What an awesome story. Never doubt God's goodness and faithfulness. He loves you so much more than you could ever love yourself. When Zeke's mom said that, that God, she was praying to God about Zeke's condition, asking God for a miracle and prayed, Lord, you love him more than I love him, more than a mother loves her son. God loves you so much. He loves you infinitely more than anyone ever could. Believe that today. What is your need today? What is your prayer? What have you been crying out to God for? Focus your mind on the love of Jesus for you. He died for you. Not only does the cross cleanse us from all iniquity, any sin that separates us from God, but the cross overcame any infirmity in your life. Think of that today when you cry out to God. Gordon and I are going to pray for you and your needs, and it's actually CBN's week of prayer. How long have we been doing week of prayers here at CBN, Gordon? As long as I can remember. <laughs> uh, so, which is a very long time. Yeah, very long uh, time. CBN was built on prayer every single noon. Uh, there was a time set aside for prayer for the CBN staff. Uh, one of the first things my father built uh, on, on the old studios at Spratley Street was a prayer room. And we would gather together and literally pray in lights for the studio, uh, pray in new cameras. When we, when we switched from black and white to color, what a huge difference. But each one of those cameras had to be prayed in. We never had any money for it all. But we had God. And when you have God, you have all that you need. That was all a learning time for us. I like to remind everyone here at CBN, and I'll remind you, the zeros have changed, but the need is still there. We still need God. We're still dependent on Him. Yeah. Without Him, we can do nothing. But with Him, and this is a great promise, with Him, we can do all things. Amen. So let's start thinking about you know, how big is that? How big are all things? How big is possible? And when you have that mindset, you're honoring God, you're worshiping Him with your request. And get that one. Mm. You're worshiping him. You're honoring him. God, I can't do this, but I know you can, and I praise you, and I thank you for the answer. Mm. Here's some prayer requests that have been sent in for a full recovery from a fall, a head injury, left hip and knee, for divine healing of a large kidney stone. I have constant pain. Then a new business. Can I, can I have success? My husband and I are starting a new business. Yeah, these are, uh, this one is for my eyes to be healed from glaucoma, cataracts, extreme dryness and blurry vision, salvation for my husband and children, and to be healed of breast cancer. All right. Well, we have a great pile of uh, requests before us. Our CBN staff is praying for these requests every day this week at noon. Ashley and I are going to agree over the ones we've read and the ones right before us, yes. as well as for you. So honor God with your request. Honor him. How great is his power towards us who believe. Let us honor him with how big our requests are, realizing he wants to answer. He wants to provide. He wants to be your God for you to be his children. He wants to be your all in all. So let's agree in prayer. You agree with us and God will do the rest. 
Lord God Almighty, we come to you, and Lord, we just honor your name. Hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So Lord, we ask for your will to be done in people's bodies. In heaven, we see that there's no one in pain, there's no one in infirmity, there's no one suffering. So, Lord, we want that here on earth. We see your will, and we ask that your will would be done in our bodies now. For anyone starting a business, anyone in financial difficulty, entering, anyone wondering what the future will hold, Lord, bring now prosperity to them. The same thing you declared in Psalm 118, send now prosperity to your people. Bless them with what they need. Supply all their need according to your riches and glory. Now for anyone who's grieving, anyone who has uh, been hurt emotionally, Lord, we just wipe away every tear. We take all of that anguish. We know you carried it away. You're able to solve every human need now. Be with them. Do miracles, Lord. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Yeah. Ashley, God's given you something. Yeah, I just believe the Lord is healing eyesight right now. There was a prayer request sent in uh, to heal from glaucoma and cataracts. And anyone who's watching right now with uh, similar diseases, autoimmune diseases that have affected your eyesight, blurred vision in one eye, the left eye, I just believe God is healing that for you right now in Jesus' name. Just claim this for yourself, receive it. The healing from your heavenly Father who sees you, who loves you, who heals you right now in Jesus' name. Uh, there was a request I read for kidney stones and I think God wants to heal and break up, dissolve away kidney stones right now. In particular, there's someone, you have a large one, you have a two centimeter stone mm -hmm. in your right kidney. It will not pass, it can't pass, you're facing surgery. God is healing you. He's able to dissolve that right now. In Jesus' name, be healed and be made whole. Yeah, there's somebody watching with a right foot problem. I believe it's with your ankle and it's you're kind of you're not able to fully walk or even fully put pressure on that. You kind of have to walk with a crutch. Uh, you've you've made a doctor's appointment. Uh, you're trying to figure out what's going on. The Lord is healing that for you right now. Just the swelling will begin to go down. All of the ligaments, the muscles will begin to be aligned again. And you are healed from the top of your head to the soles of your feet in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for everything you're doing, everything you are. You are our God and we are the sheep of your pasture. We thank you that you've chosen us, that you've given life to us. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you've been healed, let us know. Let us share in your good report. All you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. And if you need prayer, for, we're here for you. All you have to do is call us. We'd be delighted to pray for you. At noon Eastern time all this week, we'll be praying for all the prayer requests you've sent to us. We invite you to join us during our live stream of these services at cbn.com slash week of prayer. If you haven't done so, you can still send us your prayer request. All you have to do is call us 1-800-700-7000 or you can go to cbn.com and you can write out your request there. You can also mail us at CBN's Week of Prayer, CBN, CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. And we'll send you a free prayer brochure and a scripture card. Ashley? All right. Well, still ahead. Choosing between paying rent and buying groceries. Like so many others, that's what Katrina and Nathan were facing. See how you helped to feed their growing family coming up. Plus, join me on a tour of the Garden Tomb in Jerusalem. I'll show you how scripture comes to life in the land of the Bible. That's after this.
and welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. Oklahoma Governor Kevin Stitt has signed a bill forbidding the use of non-binary gender markers on state birth certificates. People who are non-binary do not identify with traditional male or female genders. Experts say it's the first ban of its kind in the country. Fifteen states and the District of Columbia specifically allow a gender designation outside of male or female. A federal court has ended the legal challenges to the Texas law which bans abortion after a heartbeat is detected in the unborn baby. That's usually about six weeks into the pregnancy. The law allows private citizens to sue anyone who is suspected of assisting in an abortion. Texas Governor Greg Abbott celebrated the ruling with a tweet, calling the measure, quote, the pro-life law that is saving babies every day. I want to remind you, you can get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Gordon and Ashley are back with more of today's 700 Club. It's coming up right after this. Pay rent or buy food. That's the dilemma Katrina and Nathan faced after the pandemic hit. Work for Nathan became sporadic, and he worried that his wife and little girls were not getting enough to eat. But Nathan doesn't worry about that anymore, thanks to people like you. Katrina loves being a stay-at-home mom, but it hasn't been easy during the COVID pandemic. Nathan's a truck mechanic. He worries about work every day. The biggest struggle is uh, walking into work one day and being told that we're going to have to lay you off for a little bit. Be working one day and the next day you're, you're jobless. We've actually had to choose between like rent and food before because sometimes when rent comes out, it gets very difficult that week and we're very short on money. Then they went to a food distribution at Calvary Cumberland Presbyterian Church, which partners with Operation Blessing. With Operation Blessing, us having to just drive down the road and get the food is absolutely a blessing to us. It's been amazing. Food distribution, it uh, helps out quite a bit. I don't have to worry about the wife and the kids not eating. Operation Blessing Partners help this ministry in Mayfield, Kentucky, feed hundreds of families every week. The food distribution, they're really awesome. They're, they're so sweet and they welcome you as soon as you pull in your cart. They will open your trunk for you, put the food in there for you. Everybody gets fed and bills still get paid. It's a godsend. It takes a lot of load off of people who are absolutely struggling in their lives and you don't know how hard it is and how thankful like I am that you do this for us, and I just want to thank you so much. Well, if you are a CBN partner, that thank you and blessing goes to you. You are a godsend. You are helping people in desperate need. Let's not forget the, that the pandemic has hit people financially hard, and people are still recovering from that. So if you're not a CBN partner and you want to help people, you want to be the hands and feet of Jesus, giving them a hand up and not just a handout, join with CBN today. It's really simple. All you have to do is give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. You can also go to CBN.com to join with us, or you can do my personal favorite. I always like to say, text us. It's the easiest way, I think. Text CBN to 71777, and a giving page will pop up. And there's different levels that you can join with us. You can join at the 700 Club level, which is $20 a month. You can go up from there to $40 a month, which is 700 Club Gold. Just do whatever the Holy Spirit is putting on your heart right now. Just be obedient to God and helping others. You know, He blesses us in order to be a blessing unto others. If you join with us, we're actually going to give you our, a gift. This is our way of saying thank you. It's Pat Robertson's latest book. It's called The Power of the Holy Spirit in You, Understanding the Miraculous Power of God. Pat and Dee Dee Robertson have created CBN from the, from the ground up, not alone. They had the help of the Holy Spirit. And if you want to know how they did that and beyond, get this book, become a partner with CBN. Give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. Gordon? Up next, Ashley takes us on a tour of the Garden Tomb in Jerusalem. Hear her message of hope from the land of the Bible right after this. Ashley spent a couple of weeks on assignment in Israel, and one place she visited was the Garden Tomb in Jerusalem, where she shared what the resurrection of Jesus means for us all. 
Today, I stand and chat with you in front of a really special place, the garden tomb. It's said that Jesus was buried here after his crucifixion. When you look at the scriptures talking about the burial of Jesus, two people are mentioned. Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man who was a secret follower of Jesus, and then Nicodemus, a Pharisee who actually met with Jesus one-on-one -on -one to understand his teachings and to find out who he truly was. When I read through that scripture, I can't help but think of Joseph and Nicodemus taking Jesus's body off the cross, carrying it to a tomb really similar to this, preparing his body for burial, wrapping his broken, bloody body in linens and anointing his body with ointment and perfume. I can't help but think of their heartbreak as they take his body off the cross and prepare someone that they admired and someone that they loved for burial. I can't help but think of the disciples and their disappointment. Somebody that they followed for three years, every single day they lived with this person, they ate with this person, they saw miracles, they heard Christ's teachings. A friend Jesus was to them, a brother Jesus was to them. I can't help but think of the women at the cross, Mary, the mother of Jesus. I can't help but think of their heartbreak and their disappointment as they watch from afar him take his last breath. I can't help but think of the disappointment, the heartbreak, the sorrow and the grief that they all felt as Jesus was laid in this tomb. But here's the turning point. I can't help but think of the radical, unrivaled joy that each one of those people experienced when they realized his body was no longer in this tomb. I can't help but think of the mourning that was turned into dancing when Jesus himself appeared to them and said, here I am. I can't help but think of the joy as the angel appears to the women and says, don't be afraid. He is not here for he is risen. I want to read a quote to you to encourage you wherever you're at right now in life. Nothing can harm you permanently. No loss is lasting. No defeat more than passing and no disappointment final. Suffering, failure, loneliness, sorrow, discouragement, and death will be part of your journey. But the kingdom of God will conquer all of these horrors. No evil can resist grace forever. I don't know what disappointment you're going through. I don't know what heartbreak you're suffering from. I don't know what grief you can't seem to shake. But because Jesus is no longer in this tomb and he is literally seated at the right hand of the Father interceding for you and I, that means that grief cannot hold us. That means that we don't have to be heartbroken forever. That means that disappointments in life don't have to last forever. With Jesus, there is resurrection life, friend, our darkest days are not the end. The best is yet to come for you. Put your hope and your faith in Jesus because in Jesus, we will always and forever have hope. Yes, we always have hope in him and what a wonderful picture of it right there, the garden tomb. Uh, it's probably not the tomb, uh, but it's very similar to the tomb. And so as a result, is inspiring to Christians all over the world. Here's a place in Jerusalem, a first century tomb with a stone that is rolled away. And this is the thing that separates A.D. from B.C. Uh, it's the birth of Jesus that we count, but it's the resurrection of Jesus that defines everything going forward. I first saw this piece uh, Thursday before Easter. Uh, I was praying for my dear mother who, who was suffering and 
God gave to me Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, where a picture of heaven, there, there's no more sorrow, there are no more tears. And here's what the Holy Spirit underlined for me. Now there will be no more pain. The former things have passed away. It's the resurrection that makes it possible. So here we are, uh, more than a week after Easter. And Ashley, tell, what was it like to actually be there? Uh, it was incredible. I mean, it really does bring the Bible to life. But being in the garden tomb especially, um, it was super peaceful. We were there before anyone else. Uh, we got there pretty early in the morning and were able to shoot without any tours going on. And it was just so peaceful. Um, you know, I had to focus on what I wanted to say, but then I also did get a brief moment to myself where I just kind of walked around and um, heard the birds chirping and just sat under these like old olive trees and really just got teary eyed, just very thankful for the opportunity but more thankful for what Christ did for us. One of the things you've been saying since your return is that you don't have to go to Jerusalem <laughs> to have the experience. Yeah, so yeah. someone watching right now who may yeah. say, well, how do I get to Jerusalem? Mm -hmm. What would you tell them that they could do to have the experience? Oh, my goodness. Um, focus on the Lord. I mean, you know, I, I had the opportunity, the amazing opportunity to go to Jerusalem, and I'm so thankful for that. But I feel like a lot of people get hung up on the fact, oh, I have to go there. I have to go there in order to have this experience with the Lord. And I felt like Holy Spirit was just like, especially to me even, you know, I can give you an experience in the middle of your car on your commute to work. I can give you a powerful experience watching a television show. I can give you a powerful experience in your bedroom, in your bathroom, um, in your office, in your cube. So just you know, spend time with the Lord and wherever his presence is, there's power, there's anointing, there's favor, there's love. It's everything you need. Yeah. The yeah. most powerful experience I ever had was in the middle of a Shiva festival in Rajamundi, India. And uh, Jesus showed up and showed yeah. me how much he loved the people who were worshiping an idol. Mm. Uh, and it completely changed my life. Uh, when you seek him, realize you can find him. Amen. And when you find him, uh, it changes everything. It changes your entire outlook on life. Uh, that hope that he gives, his appearing is wondrous and revolutionary and life-changing. If you haven't found him, I invite you to find him. It's real easy. Jesus, if you're real, if you really came for me, if you really are my Savior, could you show me? Could you show up for me? Mm -hmm. If you pray that with all of your heart, this isn't something where you joke around with God. If you want to get serious with God and pray that, He'll answer. His promise is He will manifest Himself to you. Here's a word from Jesus from the Gospel of John. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. For Ashley, for me, for all of us here, God bless you. We'll see you again tomorrow.